It is a pleasure and an honor to be with you this evening as your Hearst lecturer and to speak to you on the historical Jesus. I will be emphasizing especially this evening the question of methodology. How do you reconstruct the historical Jesus with some scholarly integrity? And I would ask you to notice the term I'm already using, reconstruct. I don't talk about the search or the quest for the historical Jesus because that makes it seem as if Jesus is out there somewhere, like the truth in certain TV series, and all we have to do is get him. Reconstruction means that this is something we may have to do over and over again with any person who is of supreme importance, either for good or for evil. So let me say a few words, first of all, about reconstruction, and then I will go into the methodology I'm using. There's a, a standard jibe that those who are not in historical Jesus studies make of those of us who are, which is that all we ever see is our own face at the bottom of a deep well. Ha, 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 ha. <laughs> Sometimes one Jesus scholar says it of another Jesus scholar, but you never say it, of course, of yourself. So when I first heard this, I thought it was a cheap crack. But the more I think about it, the more I think it is a profound truth. And so I define history. I define history as the past as interactively reconstructed by the present through argued evidence in public discourse, public debate. Now the key word, as you might imagine, is interactive. That is, there is an interactive loop between the past and the present in which the past is changing the present and the present is changing the past. So it's in between two extremes which I would call positivism and narcissism. Positivism is the delusion that you can get back and see the past totally untouched, uncontaminated, unchanged by your own viewing eye. That's a delusion. It's as if you could see your own face in the mirror, in the bathroom, in the morning, if you just looked real fast and you wouldn't see your own eyes seeing your own face seeing, if you could just do it fast enough. <laughs> Positivism is a delusion that you can see the past totally unchanged by your own viewing eye. I leave that over here. The other extreme is narcissism, which is the presumption that all we're ever seeing is ourself imposed on the past, and then we fall in love with it, like Narcissus. I don't think either of those two extremes are necessary. There is something which, the term is rather awful, interactivism, which is that we always interact with the past as we reconstruct it. We are changing it by our own process of viewing it, and hopefully, if we give it half a chance, it's also changing us. Now, if you have reached the postmodern position where you think history is not possible, the next time you're called for jury duty, try and tell the judge that you do not think you can reconstruct the past beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think his honor will not buy it. <laughs> so that's what I mean by history when I do it. Now, how do I go about investigating the historical Jesus? And understand the historical Jesus is if you were there, as it were, in the 20s of the first century, and you were a neutral observer, you were just reporting, say, for the Jerusalem Post or something, what would you actually see? You're obviously seeing some people saying, this person is criminal and should be crucified, and you're seeing other people saying, maybe this person is divine and should be followed, if not worshipped. How are you going to explain to your audience, what's this person about that can raise such absolute disparate reactions. That's the historical Jesus. What would you see? Can you explain to me why some people want him dead and some people want him worshipped? That's what we're trying to do. Now, how do you do that? The first thing I do is I separate what I will call context and text. By text, I mean the Christian Gospels. What I want to do for a moment is leave them aside. I want to let on as if I don't know them. Now, obviously, it's too late for that. But let us imagine we don't know those Christian texts, and we ask this question. What was it like to be in the territories of Herod Antipas, in Lower Galilee, 
in the 20s of the first century. Now, obviously, the only reason I know to focus on that point is because I've been cheating and looking at the text, right? But let's imagine we now put them aside, and it's as if I wanted to, to gather a group of world experts and ask them, give me as thick a description as you know how about the 20s in the territories of Herod Antipas in Lower Galilee. And to say, well, why do you want to do that? Oh, it's just random. I just happened to pick that. Don't worry. Give me as thick a description as you can do it. Now, that's the discipline I'm trying to do. Focus on context. I will not for the moment look at Mark or Matthew or Luke or John or anyone else because the context there may be a later context. I leave it aside. Now, how do I do that context? I work with three interweaving, interdisciplinary layers of cross-cultural anthropology, of Roman Jewish history, and of Galilean archaeology. And I'm deliberately making it from the, the basement, as it were, of anthropology, the next layer of history, and the final layer of archaeology. But I want them interdisciplinary and interactive. That is, they will move and influence one another. Now, that gives me three disciplines to work with. To get this wrong, I really have to blow three disciplines. Now, I'm probably capable of doing that, but it takes much more work. So, I will be watching these disciplines sort of correct one another a little bit. And it's also an open matrix that can change. New, new archaeological discoveries, new anthropological discoveries. So, a triple layer working from the broadest to the narrowest, as it were. My first layer I call cross-cultural anthropology. Cross-cultural, you understand, is that if I were to tell you I'm going to look at, say, the 19th century peasant population of Ireland and apply that to the first century in the Jewish homeland, you would laugh at me. So what I have to do is take a cross-cultural view of what do we know about peasant society in an agrarian empire. From those who have studied all of them we've got, past and present, what generalizations do they make? Now, they're not physical laws. Of course not. They're statistical expectations, possibilities. What do we find, for example, in peasant society in an agrarian empire? An agrarian empire is one which has discovered the iron plow and has, of course, the ecology to go with it. The Eskimos would probably not find it particularly useful. So the ecology and the technology for the iron plow. That would be the first question about an agrarian empire. What happens? The Roman Empire, of course, is such an agrarian empire. What happens? The first thing I find from anthropology is a huge increase in agricultural productivity. There is lots more stuff to eat. Now, is that good news or bad news for the peasants who form about 80 to 90 percent of the population and, of course, do all the work to produce this food? Is that good news or bad news for them? Now, I don't know that till I go to the anthropologists. And what do they tell me? Well, for example, they tell me this. So this is my first basic principle from anthropology. That when you have this huge increase in agricultural productivity, the rich get richer and richer and richer, and the poor stay pretty much where they always have been. If you are a peasant, that is somebody, a farmer, whose surplus is taken and expropriated by powers greater than that peasant, you can't really get much worse. As the Emperor Tiberius said, you, you shear my sheep, you don't fleece them. No, you don't skin them, sorry. You <laughs> shear my sheep, you don't skin them. So what happens in a, an agrarian society is a yawning chasm, that's a phrase from an archaeologist, opens up between the haves and the have-nots. It gets higher and higher. It's not that this gets much lower, but there's a yawning chasm. All right? That's one thing to know. Second is this. You probably wonder why, if a peasant society means that the, the agricultural producers who produce everything that everyone needs for food, why don't they rebel? Why do they take this? Why do they let superior forces, granted armed forces, take their surplus? Why aren't they in constant rebellion? Now I get to my second point from anthropology. It's almost like you have a steady state that the aristocrats take and the peasants give until you move into 
a commercializing agrarian empire. Commercializing. Commercializing means, don't think of it quite the way we would use it, that the aristocrats have learned that, you know, there's ways you could get much more if, for instance, you moved in and instead of having the peasants being small freeholders, you amalgamated all those small little 10-acre farms into a big farm with a steward running it. Now, you're not going to steal, of course, from the peasants. That's old-fashioned. You only do that in wartime. So how do you do that? Well, you offer loans. And since the peasants are always in trouble by definition, they will take your loans and you will foreclose. You didn't steal it. It's just business. So in a commercializing agrarian empire, as the commercialization comes up in one variable, resistance, rebellion, revolt comes up with it. You can chart the coincidence of those variables. In a mature agrarian empire, as commercialization increases, and it may only be a very small change, it might be just that, okay, you can't hunt rabbits anymore, or you can't go into the, the forest where you used to be able to go in. Some move in which what you have learned is if instead of taking the peasant surplus, you took the peasant lands you could make much more money. You could, for example, in the first century, plant vines and make 7% over against cereals at 5% profit. So, my second point from anthropology is watch this. In an agrarian empire, watch commercialization. Watch the point at which there's a push to increase the profits off the land. Why would you want to do that? Well, for example, if I'm an aristocrat in the Roman Empire in Galilee, I would like very much to be able to have, let's say, a marble column all the way from Egypt for my villa. Wow, a single marble column. None of these fluted things, you know, painted white that we're trying to fake everyone into thinking it's marble, but real marble. I can do that now because it's an empire, but I want more money to do it. So as commercialization goes up, resistance goes up with it. And the final point I take from anthropology is this, that when you get finally overt <coughs> resistance, revolt, when it's desperate enough, in other words, to probably get yourself killed, figuring you're going to die in any case, then that's the, the tip of the iceberg. There's covert resistance on all the layers underneath. All right, that's a generalization I take from anthropology. And one of the things I loved reading the anthropologists is none of them were the least bit interested in the historical Jesus. So even if they're all wrong, they're not all wrong for anything to do with Jesus. But that's the general understanding I take from anthropology. Now it's very general. Maybe that doesn't apply over here, but the Roman Empire is a commercializing agrarian empire. That's my foundation. And watch that word commercial because in one sense, that's going to be the linchpin that comes through my various layers. All right, let me move now to the second layer, history. Put the question this way. What went so terribly wrong between the Jewish homeland and Roman imperial policy? How do I know something went wrong? Because the legions were stationed in Syria, and whenever the legions came south, it meant the resistance was serious enough to bring in the heavy dragoons, as it were. They came in 4 BCE at the death of Herod. They came again in 66 and ended up with the temple burned to the ground, Jerusalem in ruins. Again in 132 to 135, another huge war. Basically, that meant that their foreign policy was a, was a failure. It is not a success for an empire when it has to repeatedly subdue a colony. So that raises this issue. Why were the Jews so often rebelling against Rome. If you say, well, it's a colonial people and colonial people do that, well, wait a minute. They had been under empires for almost 500 years and only once had they rebelled against those empires at the time of the Maccabean crisis. But now the Romans have arrived and within, say, 200 years, we're going to have three major wars. Something went wrong. Why? What's wrong? If you're dealing with the Irish, for example, you wouldn't have to worry. You have to, Figure, why didn't they rebel in that generation? 
if you're dealing really with the Jewish people, you have to explain why they did. So I'm asking the question now of history. What do we see that went so wrong? There's minor reasons. You could say, well, some of it was bad administration on the Roman part. Fine. What was the core reason that set these two people on a collision course? Let me go back into the tradition. Probably the most stunning single sentence in the entire Bible, including the New Testament, as far as I'm concerned, is the statement of God in the book of Leviticus, a book I know you all read regularly, which states, the land belongs to me, God is speaking, the land belongs to me, as far as I am concerned, you are all tenant farmers and resident aliens. Now, wait a minute. The land belongs to me. The Romans hearing that would say, now, this is some kind of a Jewish joke, right? The land belongs to us. We took it from you. It's called conquest. You have a problem with that? <laughs> so watch these two things. Now, you could say, well, that's just a nice idea in Leviticus, you know, a pious thought. No, it isn't. When you go through the law and the prophets and the Psalms, you find again and again that land is not another commodity to be bought and sold like a, like a sheep or a goat. Land is life itself. So, for example, the land cannot be bought and sold. It can't be handled like another commodity. That's in the law. It's not just a nice idea. The famous story is of Naboth's vineyard where the king Ahab says to Naboth, you have a vineyard, I'd like to buy it from you, I'll give you a very good price for it, or if you don't want to buy it, I'll give you another vineyard somewhere else. I would like to have your vineyard. And Naboth says, I can't do it, it's against the law to sell my ancestral inheritance. Now, poor Ahab has been very nice. He did not say, once again, I am the king, I want your vineyard, thank you very much. So he tells his queen, Jezebel, who is a Canaanite princess, who is a different economic theology, who believes in free trade. And she said, this is a calculated insult to the king. I'll take care of it. So she kills Naboth and gives her husband the vineyard. But that's the point. You cannot sell land because, as Isaiah says, if you do that, what's going to happen is a few of you are going to own all of it, and most of you are going to have none of it. So the attempt to keep the land's distribution, the land's distribution just and equitable and fair and sufficient is profoundly integrated in the basis of the Jewish law. Now if that is true, then there is a collision course on Roman imperial policy which thinks the, law, the land belongs to us. What do we want to do with it? We want to increase its surplus. We want to make it more profitable. We're not in the least bit interested, of course, in destroying it. We want to maximize its profits. And the Jewish tradition says the land belongs to God, and God is just, and the land must be handled justly. And the Romans say the land belongs to us, and it must be handled profitably. So when I look at the history then, I see the same word that I found the anthropologists using, commercialization. What the Romans did was perfectly normal. Romanization was urbanization was commercialization. They didn't send traders out on horseback as it were. They moved in and created a city. The city housed, of course, aristocrats. The aristocrats had to have land, which was the only capital in the ancient world, really. And the function of that land was to increase the profits. And as I said, the way you did that was by loans and foreclosing, all of which was tightly regulated by Jewish law. So as I look at these, if anyone takes any of this seriously, there's going to be a trouble. And that is the reason that I would say why Roman imperial policy, not because it was brutal or anything, but because it was normal, is in a collision course with Jewish tradition. So now I put my historical layer on top of my anthropological layer, and the linchpin that's coming up through is commercialization, maximizing the profits of the land. What about the anthropology? Excuse me, the archaeology. Somebody could say, well, all of that's fine, but that simply doesn't apply to, to Galilee. Galilee was just minding its own business. The Romans weren't interested in it. 
What does the archaeology tell us? Now, to be honest with you, it doesn't tell me nearly as much as I would like to know. It tells me, for example, that Herod Antipas, who took over Galilee, the death of his father in, in 4 BCE, rebuilt the city of Sepphoris, which is a few miles from Nazareth, to make it, as he said, as Josephus says, the ornament of all Galilee. So you have one big city, one walled city. 20 years later, about 20 miles to the east, about the year 19, let's keep it in 20 for round numbers, in the year 20, Herod Antipas builds a brand new capital at Tiberius on the lake. Notice the name, Tiberius. What's going on? His father had built Caesarea on the coast, a giant port which was commercializing, that's the reason he built the port, to bring in trade into the Jewish homeland. His son Antipas builds a city on the lake and calls it after the new Roman emperor Tiberius. What Antipas is doing is making his move, I suspect, to try and become king of the Jews, king of the entire Jewish homeland as his father had been. Romanization, commercialization, urbanization hits Lower Galilee forcibly about the year 20. That's my thesis. Now, I admit completely I'd like much more data from the archaeologists telling me, can you see the relationship between the arrival of these two cities in Lower Galilee and what it's doing to the countryside? What's happening to the peasants? Is this good news for the peasants? Some of my colleagues said, this is marvelous news for the peasants. They now have much more place where they can sell their goods. That's not what I would be hearing from the anthropologists. The function of the city is to control the countryside and maximize its profits. That's why you're building cities. You're not just doing it for your own amusement. So as I put those three things together, what I see is my anthropology, my history, and my archaeology starting to come together. Antipas stayed very quiet when Augustus was alive. You remember Augustus had divided up Herod's kingdom between his sons, Archelaus got the south and lasted 10 years before he found himself dumped into exile. I suspect that up in Galilee, Antipas is taking notes. Be very careful with Augustus. Don't make any moves. Augustus dies in 14. A couple of years later, Antipas starts to move. He builds a brand new city or starts the building of a brand new city and he calls it after the new emperor, Tiberius. Also, by the way, you remember he marries a Hasmonean princess, and I think he is making his move to become king of the Jews. Now, when I look at all of that, what would I call it, those layers of the context over here, what I find is not just three layers that kind of sit on top of one another, but commercialization as the linchpin that goes through it from the bottom up. Because the anthropologists tell me that when you have commercialization, expect resistance. As commercialization goes up, resistance goes up. The history tells me that it's precisely the commercialization of the land that again and again and again will cause problems in the Jewish homeland. That's what caused the Maccabean revolt against Antiochus of Syria, who was just trying in a way to make the Jewish homeland more profitable from his imperial point of view. The land belongs to me. It's not there for conquest and expropriation. So that's my context. That tells me this. By the year 20, in Lower Galilee, I expect that something might just happen. Now, can I predict that like a law? Of course not. Of course not. But if something does happen, I'm not going to let on I'm surprised. What I'm expecting is resistance in the name of God. Not just resistance, but resistance in the name of God. So, now I'm going to shift for the moment from context to text. And at the back of my mind sort of is this question. Why did Jesus happen when he happened? Or put it this way. Why did the Baptist movement of John and the kingdom movement of Jesus both happen in the territories of Herod Antipas in the 20s? Why not 10 years before, 
10 years later. Why then? Why there? Now, at this point, I'm going to start looking from text to context. My context has told me expect something. At least don't be surprised if something happens. Now I start looking at the texts. How, what text do I use? How do I, how do I do this? Do I just go into the Gospels and choose whatever ones I want that suit this? Here's what I'm going to try and do. After 200 years of study, for example, it has been established pretty much with a ma magnificent consensus that Mark has been copied by Matthew and Luke. So you go from Mark into Matthew and Luke, and that John, this is much more controversial, John may well have used Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Now, I'm seeing a stream of tradition, in other words. So the way I do it is this way. Does the earliest texts I can get cohere with that context I've just outlined for you? Does the earliest layer of those texts cohere with that context? Does it make sense in that context? Now, I don't presume it has to. I don't presume it has to. It could easily be that the earliest layer of the texts about Jesus makes sense in the 40s, not the 20s. And in that case, you would have to say the historical Jesus is lost forever behind the first layers of the texts. He's lost. So my question is, what's the earliest layer I want to look at with those texts? Now, the earliest layer we can get, of course, would be Paul. Paul's in the 50s. So if Paul spent his epistles telling us about the historical Jesus, I wouldn't be here tonight. We'd have Paul, and that would be it. But the earliest texts we can get that I can identify are two texts. One is called the Q Gospel. Q is short for quaint. Just checking. Okay. <laughs> the scholars who found that Mark was used by Matthew and Luke noticed there was another source in there, and they call it the source in German, die Quelle, or Q for short. So it's a second gospel that kind of might date back to the 50s. Secondly, a, another gospel called the Gospel of Thomas was discovered in 1945 at Nag Hammadi in Egypt. It's an independent, as far as I'm concerned, gospel. So I now have the Q gospel and the Gospel of Thomas, independent of them, of one another, and therefore earlier than either. May I repeat that? If they are independent of one another, the material that they have in common is earlier than either. It's that material I'm going to focus on. What do I find in there? For example, I find that Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God. Now that's probably, by the way, one of the things that almost all scholars of the historical Jesus agree on, which would be great news if they all agreed what it meant. <laughs> the first thing it doesn't mean is this. Kingdom of God means exactly the same as kingdom of heaven. If you don't want to use the sacred name of God, you could use heaven as a sort of a euphemism for God. That's like using the White House instead of the president. You simply use heaven, but you mean God. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven is not about heaven, but about heaven, how heaven wants earth to be. So the kingdom of God is about how should this earth be run. Put it more bluntly, the kingdom of God is how would this world look like if God sat on Caesar's throne? Kingdom of God is a terribly dangerous expression. People of God is not so hair-raising. Community of God, but kingdom of God, most Romans would say, well, that's us, right? We got the kingdom, we got the power, we got the glory. I guess that's what you're talking about. The kingdom of God, that's us. So when, for example, Matthew says in the Our Father, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. That's exactly right. The kingdom of God is about how should this be. Now, look at the collision course. Over here you have Roman policy working through Antipas to commercialize, urbanize Lower Galilee. And you have Jesus saying, that is not the kingdom of God. That might be the kingdom of Antipas, but it ain't the kingdom of God. This is, how do I put this? 100% political and 100% religious. You cannot in the first century separate those two things. 
You can't say, well, that's political or that's religious. It's a religio-political clash of different gods, as it were. So the vision of Jesus is about the kingdom of God, and that's over against the kingdom of Antipas. But does he have a program? Okay, let's say he has a vision of how it should be. Does he have a program? Or is it all sort of a beautiful idea of how things should be? Do we see any program? Now, the slogan I use to catch your memory and your imagination is that John the Baptist had a monopoly and Jesus had a franchise. <laughs> what John the Baptist did was he was the baptizer. That's the nickname given to him in the New Testament by Josephus. He was the Baptist. If you wanted to be baptized, you went to John. Therefore, when Antipas wanted to get rid of John's movement, it was relatively simple. All he had to do was take out John. And then the movement might last in nostalgia and remembrance, but it was basically a dead movement. What Jesus did in the program of Jesus was quite different, and I would like to leave it hanging that maybe he had learned from what happened to John. He told his companions to go out and do exactly what he was doing. This is very, very important for my understanding of the historical Jesus. He didn't settle down with his family at Nazareth and send out his companions to bring everyone to him, or with Peter at Capernaum, at Peter's house, and send out his companions, bring everyone to me. I have the kingdom, bring them to me. Had he done that once again, it would have been very easy to have ended the movement. All you had to do was get him. What he did was tell other people to go and do exactly what he was doing. Now, when you read those texts, two things keep coming up. Healing and eating. He told his companions to go and heal those who are sick and eat with those you heal. That might sound to you like not particularly marvelous. But think about it for a second. Healing is probably the only true spiritual power we have. And eating, of course, is the basis for material life. So what Jesus is doing is building peasant society in a sort of an anti-community to what you might call the greed community of Roman commercialization. We are going to share absolutely together spiritual power and physical power. It's a very strange thing. He never tells them to go do it in my name. He doesn't tell them, as I said, to bring people to me. He doesn't say, go do it in my name. He doesn't even say, go do it in God's name. He doesn't tell them, and by the way, don't forget to pray before you do it. He just tells them, go do it. And that is the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is where spiritual power and material power are distributed and shared absolutely and equally. It's terribly strange. Jesus doesn't pray enough. In Mark's Gospel, he only prays twice. Once at the very beginning of his life and once at the very end, which, by the way, really embarrasses Matthew and Luke. So Matthew says, well, you're supposed to pray in secret. So obviously Jesus was doing it in secret. And Luke says, well, he used to go out into the desert and pray. Well, okay, then if he was out in the desert, you don't know what he was doing out there. But, but they see a problem. When Jesus heals, he doesn't pray. He doesn't say, oh God, heal this person. If you are in the kingdom of God, healing and eating is taken for granted. It is the kingdom of God. Now he sends out people to do this. And I think this is a crucial moment in the whole history of the future. I'm not going to say that's the moment when the, when the future is inevitable. But that's the moment when it's going to be too late for Pilate to get him. Because by the time what Jesus is doing is going to, without a doubt, bring him into trouble with either Antipas or Pilate. It's only a question of will it be in Galilee under Antipas or in Judea under Pilate. Who will get him? It's only a question of time. But by that time, it's going to be too late. You're going to have a network of people who have experienced the power of the kingdom. It works. Let me try and imagine it this way. Imagine somebody who hears they killed him, they got him, they got him in Jerusalem. And maybe it takes another month before they're sure it's not just a rumor. So it's four months. 
But way back there at 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon, the kingdom wasn't switched off. Nothing changed. They didn't even know Jesus was dead. But the power of the kingdom was still operating. It's too late. It's not all dependent on Jesus. It's not all centered on him like the Baptist program was so that Antipas could take him out. Now, let me look a little bit more at that program. We talked about eating and healing. Let me say a little bit about dress, because it's rather strange. Jesus tells them, now this would be in the Q text, that they're not supposed to carry any sandals, not supposed to wear sandals, which is really weird, one. They're not supposed to carry sort of a, a bag, a knapsack. And three, they're not supposed to carry a staff. Now, all of that is really weird stuff. First of all, sandals of some type is the basic security against stones and everything else. A staff is the basic security against, say, a, a, a mongrel dog that comes at you from the outskirts of the village, let alone a good stout staff will make somebody think twice before they attack you. At least you have a defensive, if not an offensive, weapon. And they're also told not to carry a knapsack. What's the point of the knapsack? The knapsack is what anyone would carry with their provisions for the rest of the day. They're supposed to be interdependent with the people they heal. They're not supposed to be beggars. The presumption is they bring spiritual power and share it freely. They obtain material resources and share it freely. But they don't need a bag. Now, I'd like to let that sort of sink in a little bit. They don't need a bag because they're interdependent with those with whom they interact. Focus a bit on that staff for a minute. What's interesting is there is no staff in the Q Gospel, but by the time you get to Mark's Gospel, maybe 10, 15 years later, they're told to take a staff. Now, in one sense, told to take a staff is so extraordinary itself that you'd almost know if you didn't know that somebody must have said, don't take a staff, because that's part of the ordinary equipment. What's the point of this no staff? It sends a clear signal, this is not an offensive mission, as it were. I'm defenseless. I don't have the basic defensive weapon that anyone would have with me. And so by the time you get from Q to Mark in 15 years, we're saying, well, this is all a little bit too idealistic. You can take a staff. And by the time you get to Luke, You'll have Jesus revoke these conditions and mention that you should take a sword. Now, all of that is terribly important for me because it confirms something, that what Jesus' program is, is what I would call nonviolent resistance to Roman oppression. Nonviolent resistance to Roman oppression. Wait a minute. Isn't this some kind of absolutely crude and obvious retrojection of Martin Luther King, or Gandhi, or Tolstoy, or modern liberalism back into the first century. Is it? One of the things that I learned growing up in Ireland was that in colonial or post-colonial situations, you can see almost every possibility of resistance or non-resistance, violence or non-violence in the people involved. So when I went to read the first century, I wasn't surprised to find that I had the full spectrum of anything I could imagine. I, didn't, I wasn't surprised to find Josephus saying, it is the will of God that we obey the Romans. God gives power to the great empires. The power of God now rests over Italy. Do not resist the Roman Empire or you fight against God. I no, no doubt he was sincere, but the technical term is collaboration, right? Another example. In the 50s, there was a group called the Sicarii. A sica is a short dagger that you would carry beneath your cloak, and what they used to do was assassinate high-profile Jewish collaborators with the Roman system. They really didn't go after the Romans. Pilate, had, it wouldn't mean Pilate then, but the Roman procurator had too much defenses. But you could assassinate, say, a Jewish aristocrat who collaborated with the Romans. Now look what they did. 
It wasn't like you know, the assassination of Julius Caesar, more or less public. When the crowds were there on a festival day, the person was assassinated in the crowd, and nobody knew who did it. Now, I use, quite deliberately, I call that urban terrorism. Because Josephus' statement is actually, the damage they did was not nearly as much as the fear. Yeah, they weren't killing hundreds of people. Just that everyone was looking this way all the time. I would call that urban terrorism. Finally, what they really did next was when they were captured, they started capturing some of the aristocrats and bargaining ten for one. We give him back, we give ten of our guys out of prison. I thought we invented urban terrorism and kidnapping to get your people out of prison. I thought we invented all of that stuff. Now that doesn't prove I recognize that they also invented nonviolent resistance, but this does. In probably the year 26, the date isn't certain, but probably the year 26, when Pilate arrived, first of all, in Judea, he brought the standards up into the holy city with the iconic images of the emperor. And the way that was resisted was by unarmed resistance. The crowd went from Jerusalem towards his praetorium, which was at Caesarea on the coast, gathering people as they went, and they confronted Pilate and said, in effect, we're not going to leave until you change. Pilate surrounded them with his soldiers, and they said, well, then we're all going to die. Now, I would like to know who organized that. I don't think they just sort of wandered up there, backed by martyrdom. That's nonviolent resistance. In the year 41, Caligula the emperor decided to put his statue in Jerusalem's temple. Petronius, who was the Syrian legate, was given the job of taking the statue down with, with the legions. And Petronius, being a very wise person, knew exactly what this was going to mean. And he dragged his feet, he tried to postpone, and the crowds went up to meet him at Ptolemaeus on the coast, and also at Tiberias. Philo and Josephus tell us this, men, women, and children, that sends a clear message, our women and children are with us, so we're not armed, but we're not leaving, and you're going to have to kill us all. Now, once again, I don't know what would have happened if they started, but I'm going to declare nonviolent resistance was, should I say invented? Okay, was also invented along with urban terrorism in the first century. So I'm not making the statement at all that I think Jesus invented nonviolent resistance. I think it was there, I think that's what he was doing, and I think that was his program. Finally, I think it was his program because he believed that was the character of God. I don't think it was simply, well, this is the only strategy to take on the Romans. If we do anything else, they'll send the legions. I think John the Baptist had said, the avenging God is coming, and Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, so at least for the time he was under the water, he must have believed what John said. But then John was executed, and God didn't do anything at all to stop it. I think at that point, Jesus changed. That is not then the way God acts. If the avenging God didn't come in time to save John, then I don't know if the avenging God is going to come at all. So Jesus' vision of God as I see it changed. And therefore, our vision of what we do in union with that God changed. So the program that I see that Jesus is sponsoring, if you will, as the Kingdom of God program, is first of all nonviolent, but second resistance. It's not simply nonviolence. That's what Josephus was advocating. You don't rebel. It was nonviolent resistance to the Kingdom of Caesar, which is not the Kingdom of God. And at that stage, of course, you could probably tell it's only a matter of time before this man is dead. And it's not going to be a mistake. Pilate will eventually crucify Jesus. He will not round up all his followers because he knows he's not a military threat. But he will publicly crucify him as a warning that what this person is doing is subversive of the Roman law and order. And this person will die publicly. 
All right, I think what I'm going to do then is release those students who have to go up to their rooms and start working immediately all night on their papers. <laughs> so I know that they can't wait for the questions because they want to start immediately. So while they are going, and then what I will do is field questions directly from all of us who do not have to spend the night writing papers. I'd like to know what your views are on the resurrection, whether or not you believe it occurred, what kind of archaeological, anthropological, historical, historical evidence you might have either way on that. All right. Um, remember that what we've been asking all the time is historical questions. So now let me ask an historical question about the resurrection. The historical question is what did a first century Jew mean when that first century Jew used the term resurrection? All right. Forget whether he believed in it or not. What did the term mean? Like, what did internet mean for us? We all know what it means. Whether you like it or not is another question. <laughs> the resurrection in first century Judaism meant the general resurrection at the end of time, which was the moment when God finally cleaned up this mess that the world was in and justified especially the martyrs who had died, tortured, brutalized in their bodies. That comes from the time of the Maccabees when it was clear that this was not just. People were dying as martyrs, and God was not doing anything about it. Where was the justice of God? For the first time in Jewish tradition, you get a brand new idea, you can find it in, say, in 2 Maccabees, which is the bodily resurrection. That the bodies of the martyrs have to somehow be justified, be redeemed, be vindicated publicly. Now, I would like you to you know, leave a little room for the ancient people for how literal or how metaphorical that was. But what was at stake was not the survival of me, but the justice of God. Now, when a Christian Jew in the first century, like Paul, for example, let's use Paul, says God has raised Jesus from the dead, they are making the most astounding claim ever made, which is not at all that Jesus has come out of the, the tomb and ascended to God. That's not astounding in the first century. That's only astounding among all us rationalists. In the, first, in the first century, okay, Jesus came out of a tomb and went up to God. How nice for Jesus. I can show you the coin of Julius Caesar showing him streaking up to the, among the gods like a meteor. When they s declared God has raised Jesus from the dead, they were saying the general resurrection has begun. That's what Paul means by Jesus is the first fruits of them that sleep. That's why Paul will argue 1 Corinthians 15, no general resurrection, no Jesus resurrection, no Jesus resurrection, no general resurrection. Now this is an astounding claim because it has to have some evidence. If you're saying, well, the general resurrection is coming soon or the apocalyptic consummation is coming soon, you can say that all you want because it's in the future and you can't be wrong unless you're stupid enough to date it. But if you say the general resurrection has begun, you have to be able to show how is the world changing. Now, how would Paul have argued that? If, if you imagine Paul talking to perfectly open-minded pagans for whom resurrections, virgin births, miraculous healings, all of that was part of their culture. They knew the stories. So they're not going to say to Paul, as I said, like rationalists might, we, we don't believe in that sort of stuff, Paul. We've had an enlightenment here. We, we just don't believe that stuff. They're going to say, that's really interesting, Paul. You're telling me now the world is changing because God is finally starting to justify the world. Could you show me, Paul, where that's happening? Because I don't see it. And Paul would have to say, and have to say, come and see our communities. We have a small community of 10 or 12 people who meet down in that shop, you know, in the corner there where the sardines are sold. And we meet every Sunday, and we have committed ourselves to sharing, I'm making this part up, half our food, the half I'm making up, that we believe the world belongs to God, it used to be the land, land is about food, food belongs to God, we share our food with one another. If you get one day's work this week, you bring half your stuff. If you get five days' work this week, you bring half your stuff. Stuff. Come and see whether you think the world is getting more just. Come and see our society and tell us whether you think our society, our little group, we call it an ecclesia, a church, whether you think that is more just. And by the way, I should tell you that we have ones like this in every city of the empire. 
That's why I'm on the road all the time, says Paul. Well, how many people do you have? Well, it's not so much whether we have a thousand people as that we have 10 in a hundred cities. So I think that's going to be Paul's argument. Now, I could easily be listening to him and say, this guy is really nuts. Now, he's not nuts because he claims Jesus came out of the tomb. That, that sort of stuff I, I can believe. But I mean, what's Jesus ever done for me? I can see Caesar has ascended into heaven, and I can see what, that's why the Roman Empire is running so well. Caesar's up there taking care of things, as it were. That makes sense to me. I got the coins to prove it. Now, you're claiming, what does this Jesus ever do for me? But then somebody else might be listening and say, well, yeah, I, I don't think Caesar's ever done much for me. So he's, he's a customer. That's, I think, the way it happened. In the first century, none of this stuff that we claim is extraordinary was extraordinary. If all you have to say about Jesus is he came out of the tomb, appeared to people, and went up to God, that is not news in the first century. It is news in the 19th century among both secularists and fundamentalists because they are both rationalists. They don't believe that sort of stuff happens. So it never happened or it happens just to our Jesus. But in the first century, you have to have something better than that because we accept those things can happen. So tell me why I should care about Jesus and not about Aesculapius or Caesar or somebody else. So the resurrection is about is the world being changed to a more just place? If it isn't, then you cannot say the resurrection has begun. You can say if you want that Jesus is taken up to God, that's an ascension or an exaltation. But you cannot use the word resurrection except to mean the general resurrection has begun. And if you say that, you better be able to show some evidence. Yes? I will repeat the question, okay? I will repeat it. You, you just say it to me. What is intriguing to me is when you mentioned about nonviolent resistance during that time, and then there is a and it travels cross culturally to Buddhism, to Ashoka, and to Gandhi. So, at cross cultural level, do you see some link between these? And then, that my second part of my question is. Do you think that Buddha and Gandhi and Ashoka, think Ashoka's philosophy would work with the, the Nazis? All right, the two questions is, first of all, do I see any sort of genetic links between Buddhist nonviolence and Jesus, or Jewish nonviolence, in the sense we were talking about it? And two, do I think this would work in terms of, of um, the Nazis, for example? What I don't see genetic links. I don't see genetic links. I w see no reason why all of these options couldn't arise when people are confronted with the same type of situation. The full spectrum of options comes up all the way from collaboration, all the way from, from abandoning your faith to collaboration, to violent resistance, to nonviolent resistance to wait for God, can, God's going to do it, you know, don't attack them, God will do it any day. All of those options seem to come up all the time in the same situation. So I don't know, if, I don't know of any genetic links, nor do I think they have to be there to explain it. Now, if they were there, that's fine. For example, let's imagine the 30s. Now, I don't want to send any, anyone out before guns, you know, to get slaughtered but I do know that eventually six million are going to be slaughtered. What would have happened, now we're talking 1933, we're talking before 1936, before the Olympics in 36. What would have happened, for example, if people had taken to the streets? They would have got killed, let's make no mistake about that. What would have happened worldwide? That's what we don't know now. What's the worst case scenario you could imagine? Thousands of people getting killed? as distinct from millions. Now, I, what I'm really seeing here is not so much whether in any given situation, I, I, I myself, by the way, probably can't live like that. I can't do it. But violence is almost like slavery. There's going to become a point where we're going to have to say, even if we're doing it, it's wrong. And that's very much where I would be. I think we change it if at least we say, 
when we use violence, we're doing wrong. We're not doing right, we're doing wrong. And we're withdrawing from God. And I'd be quite willing to say that. Okay, I'm going to do it. It's called sin. <laughs> That's what I think sin is. It's withdrawing from, but I'm going to do it. Because I don't have, I don't have the courage of Jesus to die. So I will hit back violently. But eventually we're going to have to say, that's not going to work. Violence is going to destroy us unless we get control of it. So, you know, in any given case, I think it's the transcendental grounding in, say, Jainism or Christianity that makes a Gandhi or a Jesus capable of doing it, not just talking about it. If it's, if it's simply the idea of nonviolent resistance, then, then we don't need God a religion for that. And we could have thought that up by ourselves, but to do it. As I was saying this afternoon, I think by the third day, you know, you start hit back. That's where you need the transcendental power of believing that your God is nonviolent, or that the meaning of existence is nonviolent, and that you're plugged into that. That at least would be a step. Yes, sir. I have a question. Just uh, what was Jesus doing when he was uh, 13 to up to 30? I mean, how come there's no, no record of what was going on or it's not in the New Testament? I've always been wondering about that. He went to Ireland. <laughs> huh? What did? No, it's, it's a, it, sorry. No, it's a, very, it's a very good question. It's a very, very good question. Let me put it because it raises a profound issue. Basically, what we usually think of is, well, we have all this information about the birth, and we even have the story in Luke at 12, and then we get this great silence, as you said. I think what's happened is we've deluded ourselves into thinking that we're getting genetic information about the birth. The function of a birth story is to be an overture, not a first act. So it's not that we have a first act, and then we have a missing second act, you know, from 13 to 30, and then we get into the third act, as it were. Matthew is going, for example, to tell the, tell the story of Jesus as the new Moses. That's going to be his gospel. So right in chapter 5, Jesus is going to go up on a new Mount Sinai and say, you've heard with him said of old, but I say to you, a new, a new improved Moses, as it were. So Matthew knows that I, I, have to, I have to write my infancy story so to describe Jesus as a new Moses. What do I know about Moses? Well, Pharaoh tried to kill him by killing all the kids. Ah, Herod going to kill all the kids to get Jesus. So the infancy story that you have in Matthew, and differently in Luke, but the same thing, is an overture to their Gospels. It's not information about the birth of Jesus. Put another way, we don't have a clue of anything about Jesus beyond his name, Mary and Joseph, until the public life. We don't know anything. And that shouldn't surprise us because um, Augustus, for example, wrote his own biography to be up on his mausoleum that's why we still have a copy of it. And he begins with, at the age of 19. You know, who cares? Yeah, I did all that other stuff. But at the age of 19, I hit the public scene. So it's really, in the ancient world, when a person moves on to the public stage, that we really start getting anything. The other stuff is probably, well, this was a, this was a tremendous leader, so his mother must have had a dream the night before he was conceived or something. The infancy stories are not information about Jesus. So we don't have missing years. Everything is missing, in effect, up until the public life. So it's all missing. And that's not a surprise. That's why in lots of peop important people in the ancient world, we know the date they died, and we haven't a clue when they were born. Nobody was watching. <laughs> you know, it's, o it's only when they were, f we know exactly when they died, because people were watching at that time. But, you know, it fades backwards into. So there are no missing years. It's all missing. Uh, yes? Two questions. First one is, in the Gospels, there are multiple references to Christ or Jesus saying, or alluding to a familial relationship between himself and the Father in heaven, that he's his son. And obviously that caused certain reaction, apparently, within the Jewish hierarchy. So I'd like to know uh, if you could comment on that. And then also, um, uh, in the same vein, there's obviously a political relationship or political 
um, relationship between Jesus and Sanhedrin and Pharisees. And if you could kind of enlighten me a little bit about the inner politics that's going on within uh, the Jewish organization at that time, especially from the uh, ruling body and how these, you know, three interact. Okay, let me underline the, the language that I use. What we have to understand is that in the first century, the Jewish tradition, an ancient venerable tradition, is under extreme pressure from Hellenistic or Greek international cultural imperialism, which is like Americanization today. Hellenization in the first century was sort of get with it, get modern, like Americanization today, and got the same backlash. So you get a lot of diversity. You have Sadducee in Judaism, you have Pharisaic Judaism, you have Essene Judaism, I guess you could even talk about Sicarii Judaism, Zealot Judaism, Christian Judaism. Christianity is one more option within the Jewish spectrum of options, and each of these options is saying particularly nasty things about one another, by the way, all of them. The Sadducees are saying nasty things about the Pharisees, the Qumran Essenes are saying nasty things about the, the Sadducees. Christians are saying very nasty things about the Pharisees, none of which is accurate, none of which is job description. White and sepulchers, brood of vipers, that's not a job description, that's presidential political name calling as it were. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, you know, vituperatio was what the Romans call it, vituperation. All right, so all of that's going on. Everyone's calling one another, they're calling Jesus names too. He's a glutton, he's a Samaritan which is a racial slur, he's a, a drunkard, he's a bastard. All sorts of names are being called of one another, all within this spectrum. So in one sense, if we focus down just on, say, the Pharisees and Jesus, all of these people were saying nasty, jo Josephus was saying nasty things about everyone as far as I can see. So understand the situation. They're under extreme pressure, and they have serious decisions about for I said resistance or not resistance, violence or not resistance, or nonviolence. By the end of the century, this country is going to be in ruins. So these are serious decisions. It's not like, well, there's the hierarchy and there's Jesus. When Jesus, for example, if you imagine somebody saying Jesus is the Son of God, they almost certainly, if they use that, would mean the Messiah. It's in Psalm 2 that the Lord said to my Lord, said of my right hand. But then I'd want to know, well, Messiah what? Violent Messiah? Non-violent Messiah? What's a non-violent Messiah? So all of these options, you have to imagine, were there in the first century. It wasn't as simple as, well, there's the Roman hierarchy, excuse me, the Jewish hierarchy, and it's against Jesus. Now, the function of, of the aristocracy was to collaborate with the Romans. The function of any colonial aristocracy is to collaborate with the imperial powers which means that they get killed by both people if there's a revolt from both sides. It was particularly bad because the Herodian aristocracy had destroyed the Hasmonean aristocracy and were of doubtful validity. The high priestly class was sapped of strength because they were being hired and fired by the Herodians and then the Romans. So if I'm Pilate and I come here and say, okay, now who do I deal with? I'm used to dealing with the local aristocracy. I have to deal with a high priest who seems to be in charge, but I can fire him. That, that's not a good situation. That means that the, the indigenous aristocracy, who are the buffer between their own people and the imperial, and who have to walk the fine line of, of trying to keep both sides relatively happy, are extremely weak in this situation. They're helpless, to put it bluntly, because the Roman governor can hire and fire the high priest with whom he has to collaborate. So let's imagine Caiaphas was a saint. No particular reason to think he was, but no particular thing he wasn't either. His job is to collaborate with Pilate. He must have done it very well because he was in for what? Pilate was in for 10 years and I think he was in for 16 or something like that. And they were both removed by the Roman governor of Syria at the same time in, 20, in 36, 37. Which means they collaborated too well, I guess, even for the Roman point of view. So if you're imagining Jesus running into trouble with somebody like Caiaphas, yeah. Definitely. And it could, be, it could be from a totally Jewish point of view. You see what I mean? Not, not from a Christian point of view. 
the Essenes down at Qumran had withdrawn completely from the temple. They didn't even go there. So uh, imagine all of these as different groups elbowing one another, calling one another names, saying very nasty things about one another, because there's life and death involved here. And son of God, to, say, to claim son of God, is not something that would have made probably another Jewish group particularly happy, but it's not, it's not blasphemy or anything like that. It's simply claiming a very special relationship with God, and presumably you're male. Sort of a follow-on, you've addressed a politics, factionalism, and vituperative name-calling in Judaism. At the time of Jesus' mission, could you do the same thing with reference to the Jesus movement in the years immediately after the crucifixion? What sort of factionalism and name-calling was going on there? You mean inside the movement itself? Yeah, and what yeah. sort of issues were involved? Yeah, because actually it's quite true. We have not only to speak about the visions within... within uh, Judaism, but even within Christianity right from the very beginning. For example, I talked about resurrection theology, which we usually think of as Christian theology. As far as we can tell, the people who were behind the Q Gospel, the community of the Q Gospel, didn't use resurrection theology at all. The way they saw it is wisdom, it's coming straight out of the Old Testament, but out of the wisdom books, Wisdom dwells with God. Wisdom comes down to earth and tries to tell human beings how they're supposed to live and is usually repulsed. Wisdom came down in the prophets. Wisdom came down in John the Baptist. Wisdom is running out of time and wisdom came down in, John, in Jesus. And maybe you get very close to Jesus being wisdom incarnate and Jesus has gone back to God as wisdom always does. And maybe wisdom is not coming back again. You can do a whole theology out of wisdom and never mention resurrection. Now, have you, does that mean that Jesus is just another wise man? No. It means that he is wisdom, maybe the last messenger of wisdom before it's too late. So there, it's a different phrase. It's not using resurrection at all. But it's based on not so much the apocalyptic, so much as what's called the sapiential or the wisdom traditions. No, I don't think, maybe those could speak to one another, but maybe they wouldn't. So we have, for example, Paul in the 50s, and we have the Q Gospel around the same time. And what we really have to face now is they ain't saying exactly the same thing on a fairly profound level. But they're both foc focusing on Jesus. So that's one, one very clear one that we have. Not even to bring up, say, the Gospel of Thomas or the Gospel of John, which would multiply it. What would be your um, vision of the women in the scriptures, um, particularly Mary Magdalene, and um, your vision of the Gospel of Mary? The, the most interesting chapter for me is, for a first example, would be John 20, where the beloved disciple is exalted by denigrating first Peter, you know, the race to the tomb that he, he, Peter gets there first. Um, I think what he... No, I think the beloved disciple gets there first, looks in first, Peter goes in first, but it says the beloved disciple believes. It doesn't say Peter doesn't believe, but it doesn't say Peter did believe. So the beloved disciple is exalted above Peter, then next above Mary Magdalene, because Mary kept saying they've stolen the body, they've stolen the body, and then over Thomas, who wants to touch and feel. So I look at that and say, well, the beloved disciple, whatever community this, for whom this is the leader, is taking on Peter and Mary and Thomas as major leaders and saying as far as Jesus is concerned, the beloved disciple is really the leader. So Mary of Magdala is a major leader in the early church. That's what she is. She's not Jesus' girlfriend and she's not just bringing the coffee. She is a major, she's an apostle in plain language, big enough that you have to you know, go after her like you go after Peter or, or Thomas. Secondly, the other major text is I'm not as impressed as my feminist friends are by the fact that women are the first people who see the risen Jesus. Because I don't think those texts are compliments. They're told to go tell the guys. The guys are told to go tell the world. So it's what I call secretarial vision and executive vision. 
That's not a compliment. It wasn't intended as a compliment. Uh, no, on the other hand, though, the supreme accolade in Mark is given to a woman because the woman who anoints Jesus is the only one who has believed what he's been saying since he left Galilee. You know, Mark has, we keep saying, I'm going up to Jerusalem to die and to ra rise on the third day, die and rise on the third day. And Peter says, no way. And James and John wants to say, could we get first seats afterwards? And, you know, it's like nobody's listening. And there's women with him too, of course. Now, finally, at, in Bethany, the woman says, well, in effect, if you're going to die and rise, and I better anoint you now, because I'm not going to get another chance. So I'm going to anoint you for your death. Now, that's why whenever the gospel is told, this story's got to be told in memory of her, because she is the first believer. The first believer. Jesus has been saying it. She says, okay, I better do it now then, right? So when, when Mark tells that story, she is exalted as the first believer. The women who go to the tomb to anoint Jesus didn't get it. They're not, they're the counterpart. In the same way that the disciple, excuse me, the centurion at the cross who's a pagan, when he says for Mark, this is the son of God, that's a confession. So the first believers in Mark are an unnamed woman and an unnamed pagan. Now I think there's where we're getting the signal from Mark that this unnamed woman is supremely important. Those are complementary. The other ones are not. But in the early church, I have not the slightest doubt, because we have the evidence which has been quietly and swiftly suppressed, and which would be gone, you know, another hundred years, that women were very important. I'm not going to argue they had to be important because Jesus was egalitarian, because men can be very egalitarian and still forget half the human race. So I'm arguing that we have evidence all the way to, say, when Second Timothy, you say women are not allowed to teach men. That's precious because that tells me they were. It's very important. The analogy I use is that you, you don't announce, we don't allow any elephants in the church unless somebody has brought an elephant into the church. <laughs> so somebody is doing it if you make up a law that you can't. So women were teaching. Of course they were. Yeah. Now as we you know, normalize this community, make it look like a good Roman community. We want the pater familias to be in charge. And that's what's happening. Unfortunately. Why was it just the last one? Oh, is it? Okay, because you stood up, I'll take you then. Okay, sorry. And I'll take this one and then this one person here. Is that right? Okay. Um, do you believe that it was Jesus' place when he came on earth to try to convince everybody of the existence of God or to try to get people to live a certain lifestyle regardless of whatever God they believed in? Um, I, I don't think that would have worked in the first century because basically, as we said, on all of Caesar's coins, it was Caesar was the son of God. And if you ask people, you know, what type of God are we dealing with? Most people would say, well, it's the God that gave you the Roman Empire, Zeus or Jupiter, whatever. And he's a god of power. And that's why we have the legions and everything else. Now, I don't think Jesus would say, you know, whatever god you got, Caesar, I think you have a clash, a profound clash between gods, between, to put it very crudely, the Roman god of power, the normal god, nothing special, and the god of justice. And whether you're dealing with a god of power incarnate in Caesar or a god of justice incarnate in Jesus is the clash. So the terms that we hear like as being kind of very theological or re religious or, or like son of God, Lord, those are the titles of Caesar. So when, when a Christian in the first century says Jesus is Lord, that Christian is committing high treason and knows it. That's why they're dying. They're not just saying, well, you know, Jesus is the Lord, Jesus is the Lord. We've got lots of lords around here. He's just our Lord. Um, that would be fine. The Romans understood that. That was... In fact, a very nice multicultural empire they were running. No problem with bringing an Egyptian goddess like Isis into the Rome, into Roman, and create a temple. But there was always an edge when the Christians said it. They were saying, "You ain't." He is, and you ain't. And in one sense, you had to say, "Well, if we're talking about the same God, how can this God be incarnate in Caesar and incarnate in Jesus?" This looks like almost a joke. So yeah, they were forcing the issue. Jesus is, because Caesar ain't. 
So it, it was, and it did involve lifestyle, of course. You're quite right. So the claim they were making is that this type of God, if you wanted to see what this type of God was like, look at Caesar. Maybe what I'd do is, let, let, me, let me stop with a, or end with a, um, a story to sort of crystallize, get, get us back into the first century. Because my thesis, by the way, is if you get the first century right, we get the 21st century right. There, there was a Roman um, television show in the first century called Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? <laughs> and the first person who won a million denarii was a, a person called Riccius. And the question, the final question that was given for the, the million denarii was this. If your God or your supreme being became incarnate, would your God be A, a conquering emperor like Augustus, or B, a beautiful queen like Cleopatra, or C, a wise philosopher like Socrates, or D, a Jewish peasant like Jesus? That was the question. And so the guy thought for a while, and he said, well, I think A, because if you were a conquering emperor, you could marry the beautiful queen, hire the beautiful philosopher, and crucify the Jewish peasant. And that was the right answer. The final answer, the conquering philosopher, the conquering uh, emperor. So that's really the first question choice. Where do, you, where do you find your God incarnate? What's he look like in sandals? All right, thank you very, very much.